Hello, welcome back to Retro Break. I am so, so excited this week, and I know I say that every week, but this week I'm even more excited because I've been wanting to do this video for a long time now, and I've finally managed to track down all the games to make that possible. These are all unlicensed games by Daytel for the Game Boy Color, and I'm really excited that I finally got all of them. So in this video, I'm going to show you all of these games and tell you what they're all like, as well as a little bit of history about the developer Rocket Games and how you could actually get these games back in the day as well. And before we get started, my mind is absolutely blown. You guys are absolutely incredible. I've had three new Patreons since the last episode and that's just blowing my mind. I'll put all your names at the end of the video, but I just wanted to say now just how much that means to me. And thank you all to all the new subscribers as well. So, it's a really interesting story and there's a lot to get into, so let's get started. So before I actually show you guys any gameplay from these games, I'm going to take a little bit of time now to tell you guys the history about where these games came from, who Rocket is and what their relationship with Daytel is, how you could actually buy the games back in the day, and then we're going to take a look at each of the games individually. Like I said, there's eight different games to take a look at. So I first found out about these games thanks to an amazing magazine, and this was by far my favorite gaming magazine back in the day. This is called GBX Game Boy Extreme. And in this magazine somewhere, there it is. In this magazine, there would always be, I'm not sure if the camera will pick this up okay, yeah, there would always be these adverts for these really weird looking games with this different box that I'd never really seen before and it said there was eight different ones to collect from this company called Rocket and I was pretty clued up on my games at the time but I had no idea who Rocket were and it actually says here that you could buy the games in HMV and game as well as the Code Junkies website. I never saw these games in HMV or in game for that matter back in the day so I don't know whether that's actually true. If anyone watching this actually worked in HMV or game back in 2001 when these games came out, let me know if you ever actually saw these in the stores. The only way that I know you could get them was through this magazine itself or through the Code Junkies website. So before I get too carried away, this magazine was owned by Daytel and Daytel also owned the company Rocket who published the games. So it's a little bit convoluted, but basically these games weren't actually made by a company called Rocket. These were all made by different developers and different studios and they would license the games out to Rocket to sell on Daytel's behalf through magazines such as this one, which were published by Thin Ice Media, which was a subsidiary of Daytel. So it's a big spider web of companies, but basically they were all owned by the gaming conglomerate Daytel, who kind of specialised in unlicensed games and accessories for various different systems. So that's how these games came to be, and that's how I came to know about these games as well. And before I talk about the games themselves, I also just wanted to mention, and I am planning on doing a full video about this in the future, but I just wanted to say that the other, the other way I found out about these games was thanks to these videotapes that came with issues of Action GBX. I do have all of them, but I've only got a few of them there, the rest of them are back at my parents' house. So whenever I go back there, I will raid their storage and hopefully be able to find all of the other issues of Action GBX and all of the other videotapes and maybe make a video on, the, on Action GBX in general, because it was my favourite magazine back then. But basically these videotapes were made by Thin Ice Media, who I said were a spin-off of Daytel. So these were jam-packed full of Daytel adverts, including not just these games, but all of their accessories for the Game Boy and stuff as well, which I would love to talk more about in the future. So I guess that's it for the background on where these games came from and who made them and that sort of thing. I think it's really fascinating and I can't wait to talk more about it. But for now, let's take a look at the games themselves. I'll just start in the order that I've got them here. So the first one we'll be taking a look at is ATV Racing. So before we take a look at the game itself, I just want to take a minute and give my friend Quang from Asobi Tech the credit that he deserves. He actually programmed most of this game and left the company just before it was published. So his name isn't anywhere to find in the game itself, 
But there was something really interesting. He actually showed off all of the code and all of the prototype versions of this game that he's got in one of his Twitch streams a few months ago. It's a really fascinating topic. And if you want to see the entire VOD of that stream, I'll put a link in the description. But basically, he did a lot of the hard work on this game, and he didn't get any credit for it. So I just wanted to take the time now to give him the credit that he deserves. This is the demo we shopped around to get the... Uh, to try and sell it to someone to find it, and obviously Daytel picked it up. But to be honest, when I was with the company, no one picked it up. I had left the company um, after a year, and I, I, I thought... The game never came out. Then, uh, maybe five, five, ten years ago, someone showed me ATV Racing, and I, and I obviously I recognized it instantly as one of the games I worked on. So at some point, they took it, and gave it to some other coder. He must have finished it up and made it a game. Now, the game itself is basically, as you can see, it's basically a Micro Machines clone, but you're playing on ATVs exclusively compared to all of the different cars you can play with in Micro Machines. The controls are really good, they're really smooth, as you can see. I didn't really have any trouble controlling it, but the game is extremely difficult. You have to come in first to manage to finish the race, and if you don't come in first, you have to use a continue to try doing the race again. And I did also spot a few weird glitches where the controls would seem to mess up a little bit, and then for some reason the ATV would change colour. So I'm not entirely sure why that happened, but even so, the game itself is actually really fun to play, and I'm sure if anyone bought it back in the day, you would have had a good time with it. Now the next one here, this is one of the double packs. These were actually sold for 20 quid, I think, back then. This is a double pack of Pocket Smash Out and Race Time. And I believe that they were also sold separately, but I've only got these ones and a few of the other ones in the double packs. So let's take a look at Pocket Smash Out, and then after that, let's take a look at Race Time. So, as you can see, there really isn't a lot to say about Pocket Smash Out. It's literally just Breakout with random anime character pictures in the background, and the pictures don't even look that good. There's a few basic power-ups like this one, which splits the ball into three, and there's a few that speed up or slow down the speed of the balls as well. But the main problem I have with this game is the fact that the ball physics don't really make a lot of sense, and the paddle doesn't actually affect where the ball goes. So in some of the better breakout games that I've played, depending on where the ball is on the paddle depends on the direction that it will be fired back at. Whereas this one just seems to be completely random, so it doesn't matter whether you hit the left or the right of the paddle, the ball could just fly off in any direction it feels like. So it's not really that fun to play, and I would have been very disappointed if I bought this one back in the day. And unfortunately, this is the one that actually stood out to me the most back in the day because of the anime background. So I'm sure a lot of kids back then that got these games probably did buy this one and they probably were quite disappointed by it. So if any of you guys watching actually played this back in the day, let me know what you thought of it. I'm really not very impressed going back to play it now. So Race Time is another one of those games that Quang's code made its way into. He mentioned actually that the cancelled Revolt game actually shares a lot in common with this one. Sold through Action GPX, correct? Retrobrite Games, completely correct. Uh, ATV Racing was one of them, and the other one was Race Time, which actually Race Time looks more like ATV Racer, and uh, sorry, Race Time looks more like Revolt and ATV Racing becomes its own game. You can actually tell that the system with the arrow that shows the direction the car is supposed to go in is taken straight from the Revolt game, as well as these cars, but the other ones seem to be missing. So it's just really interesting to play both the ATV game and this race time game, and kind of think what could have been if it did become Revolt instead, which is one of my favourite games on the Dreamcast. The game itself though I don't like quite as much as ATV Racer. It's quite difficult to see where you're supposed to be going sometimes, because the graphics are a lot more zoomed in in this one. But the sense of speed's really good and the controls are just as responsive as ATV Racer. And I think it's still a really good game overall. So kudos to Quang, even though he wasn't actually credited in this one either, which is a big shame. Now the next one here, this is another double pack. And this is actually the only one that I've actually got a physical box for. They look exactly the same as they did in the advert in the magazine, so you can tell these double ones are literally just two Game Boy boxes stuck together. You can actually see the line going down the middle where the printer would have cut it in half, and they literally just wrote double pack all the way across. So it's basically like the laziest 
box design that I've ever really came across. And if you have a look inside, instead of having the nice, like, official cardboard looking inlays, it was literally just a piece of corrugated cardboard that they cut a square out of the middle where the game would go. So it's obviously a very cheap product, but I think it's really cool. And I would love to get the rest of them in the box at some point in the future. They are quite expensive now, and that's why I decided to just go cart only for the time being. But when this one popped up on eBay, I got it for a really good price. So let's take a look at these games. Let's take a look at Fall Time and Hang Time. So let me just start this section right now by telling you that I have no experience with football games whatsoever. So I don't know whether this is any good or not. All I know is with football games, I never know who I'm controlling. I know it's supposed to pass the control to whoever's closest to the ball, but it always throws me off, and I've never really enjoyed them either, so I don't know whether this game's any good or not. Hopefully, this footage will allow you to get a kind of an idea of how the game is supposed to play by someone who's fairly competent in those sort of games. Unfortunately, I'm not one of those people, but the graphics looked nice, the menus were nice to navigate, and I was actually quite surprised by the amount of different options there were in the game, so that's really cool. And one thing that struck me as a little bit weird was the really stretched faces. I just thought they looked very strange. I don't know why they drew the faces like that, they're like twice as big as their bodies. Maybe they were going for sort of a chibi look, but it didn't quite work. But the ball physics seemed good, and when I could figure out who to control, it seemed to control fairly well, but that's about as much as I can tell you about this one. And as you probably guessed, Hang Time works on exactly the same engine as far as I can tell. So once again, I played this game very badly, but hopefully you can get a good idea of what the game was like. And just like the football game before it, the menus seem really well thought out, and it does seem like a lot of effort went into these games. So I'm sure that people who enjoy these kind of sports games really did get something from it. One thing I can say about Hang Time versus Fall Time is the fact that the graphics in this one seem a lot better for some reason. They actually put a lot more effort into the animation and the look of the characters, so it does look really cool, like when you throw in the ball or when they're dribbling, I think the term is, when it goes across the floor, or when they're passing it to each other, you can actually tell what they were supposed to be doing. So that's a little bit of a step up from the other game, but it's not really my cup of tea. But if you like these sort of sports games, then this was probably the best pack to get. Now there's three games left and I think I'm saving the best three till last. So next up is Painter, which is a really interesting arcade style game. So let's take a look at this one. So Painter is probably my favorite game of the bunch. This one's based on an arcade game called Amadar and it plays really well. It's basically a mix of something like Pac-Man and Kicks or Quicks. You have to paint the lines while avoiding the enemies and you also have to make shapes that join together and then that part of the map will fill in and then you can move on to the next level once you've filled in all of the different sections. It's a really fun game, it plays really well on the Game Boy. As you can tell, the graphics look really nice and for some reason, the music is actually incredible. I actually was blown away by the music, so I'm gonna shut up now and let you listen to this banger of a song. I'm sure you'll agree that's pretty awesome and so's the game too so I highly recommend trying to find a ROM of this one if you want to play it. It is one of the more expensive games in this series so I wouldn't really recommend getting it unless you're a little bit mad like I am. In which case go crazy there's one on eBay right now for about 40 quid I think so if it's still on eBay at the time of this video going live I'll put a link in the description so you can go and grab yourself a copy if you really want to. And now the final two games here, these are Space Invasion and Karate Joe, both very different games, so let's take a look at those two. No budget collection is complete without a Space Invaders clone, and Space Invasion fills that gap very nicely. I did a little bit of digging online about this game and it turns out that it was made by a company called Thalus Interactive. And it turns out that the man who started the company also worked on one of the best games for the Commodore 64 called Mayhem in Monsterland. And after this game was released, he was actually planning on making a Game Boy version of Mayhem in Monsterland. Of course though, that never happened, but it would have been really cool to see. As well as that, I also did a little bit more digging on the company, and I found out they were also going to be working on another Game Boy Color game, which also got cancelled somewhere in development called Blitz. 
and this one was based on another Commodore 64 game called Blitz 2000. There's a few screenshots and images from this one which I think is really fascinating, so I'll show those on the screen now, and I'll also put a link to the website if you want to take a look at where I found all this information, and there's also an interview I found from the guy who founded the company back when he worked on a Commodore 64 magazine in the early 90s. So there's loads of interesting background on this game, even if the game itself isn't really anything special. So as you just saw there, this is the first game that actually credits the company that made it. But unfortunately I couldn't find anything online about a company that made Game Boy games called Octopus Studio. So if anyone watching knows anything about this company, please let me know, because this game is genuinely really good fun. This is Karate Joe, and this one is genuinely a really good game, and it could have easily been an official release. The game itself is a fairly straightforward side-scrolling beat-em-up, but the controls are really good, the characters all have really nice and big sprites, the screen scrolls smoothly and the action's fast and fun. There's also a few different power-ups and pickups that you can get throughout the game, as well as hearts that pop up from time to time to refill your health. It's a very simple game, you just keep running right and killing the enemies until you arrive at a boss and all of the bosses are actually quite difficult. It took me several attempts to get past the first one, but I did really enjoy this game, so I definitely recommend checking this one out if you're interested. So there we go guys, that was a look at all of the different Rocket Daytel games. I'm sure you'll agree they're all really interesting, and it's just so fascinating that games like these even exist and I don't understand how they were managed to be sold in shops like Game and HMV if they were completely unlicensed. I'm sure Nintendo wouldn't really think very much of that. But either way, I'm really glad they do exist and I'm really glad that I've finally managed to get the full set. Let me know down in the comments if you enjoyed this episode. Let me know if you ever played any of these back in the day, that would be really interesting. And of course, as always, don't forget to subscribe if you enjoyed this episode. And I have an announcement to make. I got another Patreon supporter. So thank you so much to Alex Baker, my most recent Patreon supporter. If you want to go and join him and get your name in the video at the end, as well as seeing all these videos early and sneak peeks and all that good stuff, check out my Patreon, there's a link in the description. So I was just copying the files off my camera to put onto the computer for this week's video, and this just popped up. So I just wanted to say a huge thank you to John Rue for becoming my latest Patreon supporter. I really can't believe the support that you guys are giving me recently. It's actually blown my mind. I've literally just finished recording now and that email just popped up. I'm so, so happy. So thank you so much, John Rue, and thank you to everyone that supported me throughout my YouTube journey so far. But that's it for this episode, guys. Thank you all so much for watching and I'll see you next week for the next one. Goodbye.